come from a family of go-getters. So just to give you a sense of kind of how ambitious I am, playing dress up as a little girl, I'm actually the daughter of two entrepreneurs. So my dad is a management consultant, and I've always admired him and wanted to be like him. And my mother's a financial planner. And so I grew up in a family where I had a really strong work ethic instilled in me at a young age. But one of the challenges that I experienced when I was about the age of the little girl in this picture was so that my parents were going through a rough patch in their marriage. And so during that time, my mom and my brother and I we moved out for a few months. We moved out of the house. And I thought it was for like a year and a half. When you're five, like, you know, two months is like two years. And so we moved out of the house, and uh, my parents realized they couldn't live with each other, and they couldn't live without each other. And so they did the work that they had to do to figure out how to kind of make that work. But I took all that stress that I experienced during that time, and I internalized it, kind of, you know, subconsciously. I internalized it, and I became the golden child. So I've always been an overachiever, a straight-A student, the good girl. And I was always somebody who kind of followed the rules and did as I was told, and and, and listened to authority, and from a very young age, I understood and I had kind of come to believe that so much of my worth and my identity was dependent on my achievement. That was something that I decided not. That's something that I think a lot of women, a lot of us do that. We think that, gosh, if I'm accomplished and I achieve things and I'm impressive and I prove myself, then I will be worthy of acceptance and love and belonging and all these things that all of us want. So that's, that's what I did when I was a kid. And I carried that pressure with me into my adulthood. And then a few years ago, as Kathy mentioned, I was recognized as the number one health promotion professional in the United States. Like, I had made it. But now I really had to have it all together. Like, I couldn't show any weakness or insecurity. I had to keep being the best because that's what everybody expected me to do. And then I had a dream. I had a dream that you don't forget, I had a dream that I was drowning. And about a month after that dream, I had trouble with my memory, I went to see a doctor, and I ignored what he told me. And then about a month after that, I started having trouble with my, um, like I had a sore throat, and I had um, swollen lymph nodes, and I was so exhausted and fatigued. And it would be another couple of months before I'd actually go back to the doctor to get treated to figure out what was going on. And the dream of drowning was kind of like that nudge. You know those nudges you have in your life where like, we, we have them all, right? It's like the thing that's like, hi, excuse me, pay attention. Hi, um, yeah, I really like you to pay attention to this. And then we're like, I'm too busy. I'm like, I have stuff to do. Anyone? Right? Okay. I think I stuff to do. I think about it right now, get away. Right? And we silence it and we ignore it and we ignore it and we ignore it until finally, right, we end up with something that I did where I ended up in that doctor's office as on, as on Valentine's Day. And I was diagnosed with um, Epstein-Barr virus, which is an acute form of mono. And when the doctor said, oh, this can lead to things like neurological damage and lymphomas if it's not dealt with, that caught my attention. And so what ended up happening is that I was hopeless, exhausted, and alone. Like, it was one of those moments where I just felt so overwhelmed by my life. And I just sat there wondering, like, how did I get to this place? Like, how did I get to this place where I had burned out at the age of 32? How did this happen? And so, fortunately, this woke me up. Like the sickness, sometimes it's something that we ignore and sometimes it's like this gift. And it was something that woke me up and it made me realize that the way that I was living my life, like just, it wasn't working. Like I was living a very disconnected life and I didn't really like who I was and who I was becoming. This is not something that I was proud of. I wasn't the woman I wanted to be. I wasn't the leader that I wanted to be. And so what ended up happening is this was a period of tremendous growth and transformation for me. Like in the two years since all of that happened, like my life is different. I am different than I was before all of that happened. And so I had to do a lot of self-reflection. Like when we go through difficult things, you notice this when you go through really difficult things and you're like totally knocking on your butt, but you have these experiences and you're like, all right, what do I have to do? Like you look at yourself in a way that you've been in denial, like you've maybe been totally denying this aspect of who you are and how you've been showing up in the world, and then you realize like, okay, I kind of have to pay attention. Maybe I have to deal with that. Like I kind of deal with that now. And so that's what I had to do. I had to really look at myself and, and wrestle with difficult questions. Like, you know, I was thinking like, who am I? And, and what are my strengths and values? And how can I grow and learn? And, and <clears throat> how can I have my life feel more connected and more authentic? 
because I was presenting one version of myself on the surface. I'm like, oh, the happy wellness chick has got it all together. And then underneath, I was like, ah, like <laughs> I was struggling. You know, and as women, I think it's I think it can be really challenging because we feel the need, like this pressure, to constantly prove ourselves and to prove our value. Especially in what's often a male-dominated industry, right? Like there's this even more pressure, like you have to be technically skilled. And you've got to have all the emotional stuff down too. Like you've really got to just be extra good at everything. And isn't that a lot of pressure? To like carry the weight of that on a daily basis? Like, don't even think about like, oh, how am I gonna do this at home too? Because then I gotta be a, you know, a good parent or a good partner or a good friend or an aunt or whatever the heck you are. And so like that pressure can be tremendous. And so what I am gonna challenge us to do today is to think about how we lead differently. To think about how we show up in our lives differently. And I care about how these things help you through your job, like I absolutely do, but I also care about what we're gonna talk about today and how that's gonna make you a better parent, how it's gonna make you a better friend, how it's gonna make you a better partner. So you're gonna have some moments today of like, yep, yeah, that's me. Some moments of feeling kind of like uh, found out, that's totally okay and completely normal. Like we all have these moments of when we see ourselves in someone and we're like, oh, that's, that's totally me, just own it. Like just, I'm gonna encourage you to just own who you are and own how you're showing up. And hopefully we'll have some time to you know, laugh together and, and just and, and connect with each other and all of that. So with that, we're gonna look at three specific things that you can do to be a more human leader and to connect. And the first is to show up intentionally. Most of us, when we go through like our days, we're kind of on autopilot. You ever feel like that? You're on autopilot, like, oh, I do the thing, and then I do the next thing, and I do the next thing, and then I go to bed, and then I do the next thing the next day, and then you like 10 years go by, and you're like, how did I get here? How did I get here? Like, I don't even know what the heck's going on. So we're living on autopilot. We're not like thinking about how we're showing up intentionally. And so one of the things that happened when I when I came out of that experience of like burning out. And I finally kind of got my health back to a place where I could like function normally and not need 12 hours of sleep a night. I started to think about like, okay, well, like what broke down? Like where did the system break down? Like what, what am I missing? What am I not doing well? And I had read this book called In Every One Culture, was the name of the book. And in the book there was this description of this woman who was like really accomplished and really hardworking and she'd been at this company for a while and she was on the leadership team and she got booted from the leadership team. She was like, uh, like, what's that about? And so they said to her, they're like, uh, you don't, you like, you're, you don't really have like these people skills that we kind of need you to have. Like, you're not super self-aware. And so what I realized when I read that book, I was like, I have some, I have some uh, resets to do. I have to have some conversations with some people. And so I went into work the next day, and I sat at my desk and I was like, who am I supposed to talk to first? Who do I need to like reset with first? Because in the midst of my burnout, I had like dropped the ball on some things that worked like naturally. And so you remember that moment where you like ask a question and then you kind of get a get an answer and you're like, it's not the answer I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually would like a different answer. Like, let's try that question again. So I realized like, okay, the name that came up for me was literally the last person I wanted to talk to. <laughs> it's like, but she's the most difficult one. Like, I want to talk to her first. <laughs> And so I resisted, I was like, all right, Rachel, like you're trying to be different, so have this conversation with her. So I went into her office, and I just said, do you have like five minutes to chat? She's like, yeah. So I went into the office, and, and I said, you know, I just, I just want to apologize. Because the way that I've been showing up is like, that's not really like the best version of who I am. Like when I got sick, I, I realized some things, and I realized that, you know, I have not been very approachable, I have not been very accessible, I've not been really easy to work with. And part of that reason is because when I got this award, I thought that everyone thought that I needed to be the best, and so I put the pressure on myself as like, you have to always be the best now. You have to always have the answers now. And you have to always have the best ideas now. And that's like a lot of pressure. It's like a lot of pressure to carry, we all do some version of that, don't we? We do some version of that where we like take on this belief of who we have to show up as, and no one ever actually stated, and then we have to show up that way. Whether it's I have to be strong, or I have to have it together, or I have to know everything, or I can never look incompetent. Like we all have some version of how we do this. And so interestingly, after I did that, I said those words and then I shut my mouth and I was like, 
you. She could totally just like nail me right now, right? Like, cause I am exposed. You know, you like get really vulnerable and then you're like, all right, I'm exposed, go for it. And she said, um, she was like, Rachel, I didn't go to college. Like, I am constantly like wondering when this company is gonna figure out that I don't belong in this role or with this authority. She's an operational role at the company, been there over a decade. She's like, I'm, I'm counting down the years to retirement until someone realizes that I don't really like belong in this spot. Someone realizes that I don't actually know what I'm doing. I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm not. I was expecting you to say that. And so then we had this moment of like, we cry together and you know, we had this moment where we're like connecting over that and it didn't like fix everything. But it gave us this experience to just like see each other and to show up intentionally and to have the self-awareness to be like, yeah, this is the thing I'm doing. And she's like, yeah, this is the thing I'm doing. And it just gave us this opportunity to kind of like connect with each other, you know? And so what I learned from that experience is that all of us have like blind spots in some way, right? We all have something that we do that's like probably annoying to somebody else that we're not really aware of that we're doing it. Or maybe we're aware and we like pretend like it's not there, a thing that we do. And then we just hope people don't notice. Or we just kind of like move along with that's just who I am. You ever do that? You ever people say that? Well, that's just that's just how it is. Which basically means I'm not gonna try to change. Get over it. <laughs> not the most effective response. And so what I realized is that like that there was this blind spot. And in a lot of organizations, maybe you have people at your company that um, anyone have anybody that's like uh, maybe raises their voice at your organization? Or do you work in an organization where people perhaps yell at each other? <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> And think about a day, if you had someone, you had someone yell at you work ever, raise your hand if you had someone experience, someone raise their voice, criticize you, shame you, humiliate you, yeah. You probably didn't go home and were like the best like person ever, right? Like when someone crushes us at work, like we carry that with us. And so what I've come to learn is this, I've come to learn that the way we treat people uh, in our care affects the way that they go home and treat people in their care. So it matters how we show up. Sometimes we're like, I'm having a bad day. So guess what? Everyone's going to have a bad day. You feel that way? You're like, I'm angry. Everybody's angry. Like, <laughs> that's not productive, by the way, or mature. But we've all been there and done something like that. But we have to acknowledge that as leaders, whether or not you have a leadership thing in your title at all, like everyone is in some capacity leading. Other people are following you, whether, you know, whether or not you know it. And so we have this responsibility to own how we're showing up. Because the way that we treat people in our care affects how they go home and interact, right, with their kids and with their families and that kind of thing. So we have to be more responsible in terms of how we are leading. Now, from a future ready leadership perspective, the reason for this, the reason caring all these other things matter, there's a study that over 50,000 managers. And they found that the leader's overall effectiveness was determined more by warmth than by competence. So there's over 50,000 people, men and women. And so sometimes when we hear something like that, we're like, well, warmth is kind of like, that's like weak. Like if I'm too nice to people, they'll take advantage of me. Anyone ever felt that feeling? Like if I'm too nice to people, they're gonna like walk all over me? Maybe sometimes. I find that it's more common in a room of men, that people are afraid, like if I'm nice, they're all gonna you know, take advantage of me. And so what I'd like you to do right now is I'd like you to think about, I'm not gonna explain what warmth is, I'm gonna give you your own way of kind of interpreting that. I want you to turn to someone sitting next to you, introduce yourself and share with them. Think about a leader that you've had that you would describe as a warm leader. You don't have to like say who they are, but think about some of the qualities, some of the, like, some of the behaviors that they exhibited, some of the things that they did. So think of someone that, even if you've had, never had a good leader, think of someone that you know that is a good leader. <laughs>
talking about warm computers. What are some of the sort of behaviors or words you use to describe them? Nurturing. Nurturing. Caring. Reassuring. Yeah, Respectful. Whisper. Tone. Genuine. Giving. I missed one in there. Reassuring, respectful, genuine tone, giving. Listener. Listener. Okay. Ah, isn't that ironic? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, I struggled with some of these things. 
And so I've intentionally had to work on them, and it's not easy. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard to do at times. So part of self-awareness is like understanding that, understanding the importance of how we're showing up, like are we friendly? Are we listening to people? Are we making eye contact? Are we asking how their weekend was and like staying around to listen to what they said? Are we approachable? Are we accessible? Like all of these things make up a warm leader and these are things we want to be. Other piece, and what we're about to talk about, by the way, this is going to potentially help you in your personal life in a very significant way, possibly. So um, I get really, really excited talking about this next thing. And it is self-awareness around how you respond to stress. Anyone here ever feel stressed? Like, <laughs> oh, every day. Uh, so one of the things that my husband and I have learned, um, we, I, so I married a guy who comes from like a, a German farming family, his dad's an engineer, his mother's an ICU nurse. I come from like a family of entrepreneurs who talk about our families all the time. <laughs> so you can imagine this dynamic. It was like a total dream when we first got together. <laughs> and so one of the things that I've learned in terms of our stress response is that we tend to respond to stress in one of two ways. So one of the ways we respond is by minimizing. And the other way is by maximizing. So here's what a minimizer sounds like. Pay attention to these descriptions and see which one sounds more like you. So the minimizer, when they're in a state of stress, they like withdraw, they retreat, they're like, get me out of here. They're like a turtle kind of like crawling into their shell and hiding, like when there's a state of conflict or tension. They're like, get me out of here. Like they kind of withdraw, they check out, they're not very talkative, they just kind of like, I'm just come here, here, hiding. <laughs> Until I feel safe to come out. And then on the other hand, we have the maximizer, and what the maximizer does when they're in a state of stress, is the maximizer, like everyone knows when the maximizer is stressed. They're like very vocal, very expressive, like they tell you how they feel, like they want to deal with it right now, and you feel like they're a tiger ready to pounce on you. So maybe you can connect, maybe in your personal life you can connect to one of these two. So we, we tend to be turtles that minimize, or tigers that maximize. Now we're not one or the other, like we all have turtle and tiger in each of us. But we generally, as children, I'm gonna for a second go to that like childhood thing, because like it does affect us. And so generally speaking, we pick kind of subconsciously our adaptation response to stress when we're little based on how people deal with us. So the kid who was like, let's say like tugging on like mommy's like, you know, pant leg, like mommy, 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 mommy ignored that kid. So that kid was like, okay, well, I'm not gonna get my needs met, so I'm not gonna have needs. So I'm just gonna be quiet and I'm gonna go on my shelf. That's one of the things that happens. And then over here, you have this other kid. It's like, mommy, 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 and then the mom's like, what? And you're like, oh, okay. So if I'm loud enough and I just stir up enough trouble, then I'll get attention. Got it. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna act out when I need attention. So I am a tiger and I marry a turtle because that's how it works. Generally speaking, turtles and tigers marry each other. <coughs> just some sick joke. And <laughs> the reason for that is because, like, so when my husband and I started dating, right, like, things were great, right, so, so I love to talk, obviously, and so I would, like, talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and, talk and, and he would, he would just listen, and I have a lot to say, so. and I would, like, talk and talk and talk some more, and I have a lot to say, I have feelings to share, and then he would just listen. But then eventually, like, the thrill of having a sounding board started to wear off. And I was like, I don't even know how he feels. So, so I'd be like, tell me, what do you think? Like, what do you feel? Like, tell me what you feel. Like, use your words. <laughs> <laughs> tell me what you're feeling, you know? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> and then he's like, what is this? I signed up for, like, I don't have to talk to you. drawn to tigers because they're like, oh, this is fantastic. I don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone feeling convicted right now? Yes. Okay. I can help you in a second. I'm not just going to make you feel like dumb. But, um, and then the tiger right, loves the turtle because they're like, oh my gosh, they listen so well. <laughs> this is so great. I listen. This is amazing. So what we've learned through this process is that, again, neither one of these is an excuse where it's not like, I'm just a tiger, so deal with it. Or like, I'm just a turtle, so get over it. 
we have to learn how to adapt, how to flex, so that we can give the other person what they need in order to get what we need. So one of the things I've learned, so first of all, think about whether, so, so out of curiosity, who relates to more of the turtle? Because like, I'm more of like the turtle. None of these are good or bad, by the way. So, okay, who, just, who relates more to the tiger? Like, when I'm gonna say the stress, okay. All right, so I'm gonna have about two thirds tigers, turtles. Generally speaking, women tend to be more of the tiger, but there's about, it tends to be about 75, 25. And so what we know is that when people are doing this or they're doing this, they don't feel safe. They don't, neither of those people feel psychologically safe. And so they need something from the person they're interacting with in order for them to kind of let their guard down. So what the turtle needs is the turtle needs space. Like, leave me alone. <laughs> That's the message of the turtle. So, interestingly, my, my husband and I, like I said, we've been working on this about six years. And so I had come back from the therapy. You're like, you are such a talker. If you come back from therapy, you're like, I just figured out so many things about my life, and I'm going to tell you all right now. <laughs> six-year-olds all day and I'm exhausted. So I've had to, I know, he's not one of your school visit teacher, so he's like kind of a dream and he's super cute. But anyway, because <laughs> <laughs> I got real lucky. Um, he put us in hard work. So he needs space. So I've learned that he needs space. And so what I did is what I used to do is I'd come back from something like that and be like, what do you think? Tell me right now. Tell me right now. Oh my gosh, tell me in two seconds. And then he would like freak out. <laughs> That's not how he operates. He's like turtle. He's a turtle dad, right? It's a process. <laughs> and so what I did is I, as I asked him a question, I said, "Is he having therapy?" And I asked him a question, and I let it sit for an hour. <laughs> it was painful. <laughs> there's a little tiger in me that's like, Ur, you know, like really wanted something to happen, and and he gave me what I needed. After an hour, he shared with me what he thought and what he felt. Because I've learned that that's what I need to do in order to get that out of me. So it's, for me, it was been an exercise in self-awareness to know that when I show up like this, I'm not going to get the best out of him. And so that was one helpful thing for us. And so what we know that the tiger needs to feel safe is the tiger needs to know that you have their back. <laughs> so <laughs> so when tigers are like having their moment, we have our moment sometimes. When we're having our moment. What I really need the most from the person that I'm freaking out to is for someone to be like, um, so what can I do to help? Like, give me something to do. Like, yes. Or, for instance, because my job is like all over the place, I travel a lot for speaking, my schedule is inconsistent, this is very predictable because I'm a teacher. Like, today, for instance, like, he'll make dinner. One of the ways he has my back is I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat and when I'm going to eat dinner because he'll have it together when I get home. This is one of the things we've worked on in our relationship to know that. I need to know you have my back. Or if I'm freaking out because I left something at the office and I have an event the next day and I'm like still trying to run through my content, he's like, do you want me to go to the office and pick it up for you? I'm like, yes. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask you for that because as tigers, we tend to not ask for what we need. We tend to explode at people, <laughs> which is not exactly the five one. Uh, so this is really important. So think about like not just at work, but we're going to come to the work piece in a second. Do you see how this dynamic plays out in your personal life? How important it is to show up intentionally and to be self-aware? Because I could just excuse a tiger and be like, let's just tell him and deal with it, right? But no, I understand, no, I, I need to flex. I need to give him space in order to get what I need. And then he needs to flex. He needs to be the one to take initiative when he's usually the one that wants to just like sit on the couch and hang out and, and watch a movie, right? So to understand what the other person needs, very, very important. So the way this plays out at work is here's the dynamic. Either we have the, the humble turtle, we have the confident tiger. Now, in our culture, for whatever reason, the word confident is used more positively than the word humble. Yet, I think we could all agree that we could use more humility these days. Yeah? Plenty of like people parading as confident that are just terribly insecure and obnoxious. But uh, humility is an underrated value, I believe. So these are both good things. But taken to an extreme, a confident Tiger can be arrogant. That's my shadow side. I can be arrogant. Like, I know it all. Or if you're the humble turtle, you can lean toward insecurity and doubt yourself and doubt yourself when you have something significant and important to contribute that you're so insecure that you don't do it. So think about yourself. I know you have like a folder. You can write it on the front of the folder. Some of you probably don't want to do that because you want to have an actual notepad to write on, which is 
be rebellious today. Um, write down somewhere which of these you connect with. Do you connect more as you say, I, I connect more to the turtle? And I know some of you are going to want to like fight me on this and be like, well, I'm both. Okay. Person who knows you really well, would they say you are? <laughs> so just jot down, like, you connect, just say what you connect more with. Do you connect more with the tiger? Or do you connect more with the turtle? Who needs a, we have a couple of minutes left. <laughs>
it's two people that are both a tiger or both a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would suggest with that is, I mean, first of all, they're human. So everybody wants to feel seen, heard, valued, and, and accepted, regardless of which one of these things they are. And so the important thing to recognize with that is like, that's, that's the first thing. When you are trying to help, kind of the language to use is like coaxing the turtle out of the shell and kind of like calming down the tiger. So when it comes to having like two turtles talk together, like one of the things you might find is like, what is the most effective way for you to feel um, heard for you to communicate? And they might say, I want to send an email before I have this meeting or have this conversation, or I want to have time when something is asked, I want to have time to process it and not feel like I have to respond right away. And if you have two tigers, you might want to have like a turtle in there as a mediator. Like to have somebody in there that can help like guide the discussion and say, hey, I know that when we get in these conversations, <laughs> someone's connecting to that a little bit. Um, <laughs> then when we have two tigers going at it, it's like to have the self-awareness, just even to say, hey, I went to this thing and I learned this, and I learned that we have generally two ways for it's a stress response. So we're not judging them, right? So I learned this dynamic, and which of these do you feel you connect to most? So you're not labeling them, you're giving them the opportunity to self-identify. And if they're both self-identifying, like, oh, I'm totally that. It's like, yes, I was thinking about that too. And I'm wondering, like, maybe that we could be more effective as a team if we took on a little bit of these behaviors too. What do you think? So that's one of the ways I like to approach something like that is, is, is one, not making it feel judged, not making anyone feel labeled because nobody likes to be stereotyped, right? Raise your hand and be stereotyped. Okay, nobody. So when it comes to something like this, I think that's one of the most helpful things to do is to just or even ask them, like, what are some of the things, you know, when you're not being your best, what are some of the behaviors that you think you exhibit? And to, so by asking them questions, you can help them become more self-aware. And what are some of the behaviors when you are at your best? What are some of the things that you notice that you do? And so by asking those questions and even documenting them with those two people, you can help to, to create some self-awareness. Because there's a lot of people, interestingly, as we do some research about self-awareness, and, um, you know, when you ask them if they're a good driver, and I was like, I'm a good driver. And you're like, why are there so many accidents? <laughs> Same as other people as well. <laughs> Same as self awareness. Most of us think we're very self aware, when in fact, like a very small percentage of people are highly self aware. So part of it is people just lack the self awareness. So what I just asked, that's what I just asked questions. Yeah. So part of this, this self awareness skill, is part of emotional intelligence. And so when we look at some of the skills that we have naturally as leaders, and the skills, by the way, that are going to be the most important as we go forward, because as technology increases and improves, like technical skills are going to become table stakes at a certain point. And so we're really, the people that are going to stand out as leaders are going to have these skills. They're going to have these skills. Now, interestingly, um, we often have a perception that women, like there's a societal perception that like women are more emotionally intelligent than men. And we really don't have much data to support that but we do have data to support this. That when asked to predict how their supervisor would rate their emotional intelligence, women's predictions were three times lower than men's, despite being rated slightly higher by their supervisor than men were. So we self-assess, we like think, we rate our emotional intelligence, because we're so darn hard on ourselves. <laughs> we rate our emotional intelligence as lower than it is, even though our supervisors view us as more emotionally intelligent. So this is again when it comes to being like self-aware, this is one of the things that we have to think about is like we're often pointing ourselves, we're sabotaging ourselves because we don't think we're as emotionally intelligent as perhaps we are. Now one of the ways that I like to encourage people to increase their emotional intelligence and their self-awareness is, so I love quizzes. Anybody else a quiz junkie? Like you love taking assessments? Any, who hates quizzes? Sorry. <laughs> Deal with it, I'm up here. So, <laughs> there are two that I like in particular, I really, really like, and I'll send you a link afterwards to both of these, so Debbie's going to send an email afterwards with links and books and that stuff I mentioned, so you don't have to like write everything down. Via character strengths is an assessment that looks at 24 different character strengths, and so these were determined like over time from thousands of years, what are some key strengths and virtues that people exhibit when they're at their best. So you take, it's a free assessment, you take and you get a list of 24. When you look at the list, you will be tempted to look at number 24 and be like, what's my weakness? This assessment does not measure weaknesses. That is just your lesser strength. 
It's going to be really hard for you to think that. That's what I'm telling you now. Because I know human behavior, and you will look at the last one, and you will judge yourself. Don't do that. <laughs> okay? So take the test if you're not going to do that. The second one is Strengths Finder. So who's taken uh, Strengths Finder before? Clifton Strengths Finder? It's an excellent assessment. Taking these assessments, one of the best things this has done for me as, as a woman is it has given me language for how to communicate what I'm good at. So we're on Strengths Finder. My number one strength is Achiever, which is like, one of the reasons I probably burned out. Um, but, but like achiever, strategic, so I naturally have a vision for things, ideation, I love the creative process, significance, like if I'm doing it, I want it to matter, and activator is like, I'm always, my head's spinning with all new things I can be doing all the time. So when I learn that about myself, it helps me language how I can best contribute. So I can say, I'm really good at helping people get unstuck because I naturally think in the world of possibilities. Or if I'm gonna, as, if I'm gonna speak somewhere, I really want it to matter, and I really want it to impact people, not just for their job, but for their personal life, because that, to me, feels significant. So by understanding what my strengths are, I can language how I can best help people. So I would encourage you to do this. That book is maybe like 16 bucks, there's a code in the back of it, that you can take the Strengths Finder assessment for no additional charge. I would highly encourage you to do this, like in the next week. If you don't do it the next week, you're not gonna do it. So maybe you might go home and do it tonight, okay, which is great. But do this for yourself so that you understand. Like as women, we're told that if we say things we're good at, we're bragging. No, we're just advocating for ourselves. And we have to do that. Especially in male-dominated industries. Like we have to advocate for ourselves and to know and own our strengths and be able to speak up on behalf of that. So take one of these things to do. I want you to think about like whether it's about I'm exuding warmth and friendliness. I feel like I struggle with these things. Like pick one that you're gonna intentionally flesh you more of. Identify whether you're a turtle or tiger and buddy up with somebody at work who can kind of help you bring out that better side. And then complete, yeah, better side, other side. And then complete either the VIA survey or the Clifton Strengths Finder. You could both of those things, like I said. So just like pick one of these things. Like which of these would you be most excited to do? Maybe jot down like, all right, I'm gonna do the VIA character shift because it's free and it's right online, easy. So that's self-awareness. The reason we spend so much time focusing on that is because most of us are not self-aware and we don't need to do that, all right? So the next thing we're gonna look at is getting curious. Really effective leaders are curious leaders. Now, I had the opportunity in my work to talk, <laughs> to talk with lots of leaders and um, I shared some of my experiences and my struggles that I've had. And so I was talking to one leader who shared with me that she is the youngest of eight children and is the only girl. So imagine how competitive that must be, right? Like, you gotta like get a word in edgewise and like, right, like show up and all that kind of stuff to be competitive. And so she was really vying to get like a, a, a senior level role at her company and was struggling too. I was like, I'm not sure like what's going on why this isn't, like, you know, working. So I really want to get this position. And so she decided to do she decided to do some self-reflection. And she decided to have a 360 gun. Anyone ever have a 360 gun on you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. people around. Yeah. Talk about humbling, huh? So she got feedback from her. It's like, you know, the leaders of the organization, other leaders, her peers, her team, and really was like finding out like, okay, what are the things that um, I could work on? She gets this report back, it's like multiple pages. And it's like, you know when you're like, you care what you wish for? <laughs> Like, I thought I wanted this feedback. Um, and we got the feedback, and it was like, you know, some of it was pretty shocking. It was like, uh, yeah, like, one of the things I remember that she had said to me, she's like, when I decided I want something, I'm like a bulldog. And I like grab on, I don't look good till I get it. And I never do that. You're like, I know what I want, I'm going after it. Yeah, like, we do that. We don't necessarily realize the impact of this. And so she said, she said, I was so busy building my department that I neglected to build relationships. She had some of the feedback that was really hard to hear. It's like, you know, we want you to be a servant leader, and we just think about yourself. Or we don't think you listen to us. Like, we share things that we want, and we don't think you listen to us at all. And we just want to be included. If you're making decisions that are going to affect us, include us, please. And so she decided to take the time to read through that feedback and work with a coach. And it's a process, not an event, right? Change is a process, not an event. And to work through that feedback, to like little by little begin to improve the things that are hard. And one of the things we had a conversation about was just like relationships, just relationships is hard. Who, who agrees? Relationship stuff is hard. Anybody? <laughs> if anyone says it's easy, I would love to have a conversation. <laughs> it's hard. 
And I just want to, I want to honor. It takes a, it takes a lot of one humility to do this. And I asked permission before I could share this. And so um, Kathy Hum is actually the person I was just talking about <laughs> from Harkins Builders. And her team is here as well. She has a phenomenal, can you just raise your hand? I just want people to like see the team. I know they are, but these are like my turtles. <laughs> humility and strength and courage, but you know what's on the other side of that? Like connection and growth. When we're willing to be curious, it changes things. It changes things. Now don't ask for this feedback unless you're ready to act on it, by the way, because then that's even more annoying for people that needed the feedback. So we have to listen, right? Like, <laughs> oh, I'll you. So we, we have to listen. And this is one of the things that a lot of us struggle to do is to listen effectively. And so when we look at this, I want you to think about how do we listen empathetically? For the word empathetic, you know, empathy a lot. Empathetic listening means I accept you even if I don't agree with you, which is a totally foreign concept in our society. <laughs> because usually, right, it's like if I don't agree with you, it's like character assassination, you're a horrible person. So empathetic response, when we're talking to somebody, we're listening empathetically, we're understanding, recognizing, and accepting. So we're saying, I'm so glad you told me that. Or we're saying, um, gosh, that, that sounds like that must be hard. Well, thank you for opening up to me. Or it sounds like you're saying this. Did I get that? You ever notice when someone does that to you, you're like, oh my gosh, I like, yes. Rarely do we want someone to fix us. Rarely. We typically want someone to listen to us. That's what we want. We want someone to listen. And so this is what empathetic listening looks like. It's hard. It's hard. Most of us have not ever learned how to do this. On the other side, non-empathetic responses are a lot more common. I only accept you if I agree with you. And if not, I will like totally annihilate your reality. So dominating, avoiding, dismissing, judging. Anyone know people who do this? Anyone here ever done this? Yeah, like we've all done both of these things. And so what this looks like is like, oh, you know, um, we'll say something like, oh, same thing happened to me, or it's not that bad, like suck it up, or just like get over it, it's not a big deal. You know what that's called? That is dismissing, that is basically saying to the other person, your reality doesn't count. That sucks. Like when someone makes us feel that way, I guess we do, really. Shoot, turn on fire, I don't care if shut down. Like, I don't want to talk to you. So one of the things we can do is we can dig deeper and ask these types of questions. So when we're in conversation with someone, by the way, take this home with you too. This works at home and at work. Tell me more about that. Typically when we're in conversation, people are like, are, are you done? Like, are you done yet? Is there more about that? Let me see if I got that. It's called mirroring. I mirror back to you. I heard you say, let me see if, what I heard you say was this, did I get that? And you're like, so heard. Like, this is amazing. So these are some of the things you can do to dig deeper in conversations to feel more um, empathy. Something that everyone can do starting this evening. When you are talking to other human beings, put your phone away. And it's kind of so silent. <laughs> 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 and hilarious. No judgment free zone. But having the phone out stifles interpersonal closeness and trust. And in this particular study, it prevented participants from feeling empathy for each other. This also applies to watches that have phones on them. So anyone ever been in a meeting with someone with like an Apple Watch or something? Oh yeah. And like, oh, I'm listening. I'm not. <laughs> Multitasking is a lie. And the reason why we put the phone away is, is this. So let's say, let's say that like we're at dinner together, right? Okay, we're having dinner together. And then I decide we're having a great conversation. And then I just get up. And I just start, I leave the table, and I just start talking to you. Let me just start having a conversation, I just act like you're not there. This is what we're doing to people when we are in conversation with them and we take ourselves out. That's what it feels like. We've gotten so used to it that we're like, that's just normal. I expect to be ignored. <laughs> Why is that acceptable? <laughs> so we can start, even if you're like, nobody else in my company is going to do it, start doing it. Start being the person who, when someone's talking to you, put your phone away. Put it away. When you're in a meeting, put the phone under a book, put it in a drawer, like put it away. Right? Begin to ask people questions and to get curious. When we do this, when we are present with people, here's what we're communicating to them. We're communicating, I see you, I accept you, and you matter. 
I see you, I accept you, and now, this is what everyone wants to feel, and most people don't. And so when we give someone the experience of our full attention and our full presence, it's almost overwhelming, because we're so not used to it. Be someone who gives other people your full attention and your full presence. You will stand out as a leader. You will absolutely stand out if you do this, because most people do not do this. Now, when we talk about getting curious, part of this can be around feedback. So I just shared an example of a 360 the way of getting feedback. Now, women ask for feedback as often as men do but we tend to get less response. So we tend to ask for it just as much, but we don't get as much feedback. And if we do get it, it's really vague. So there's actually a term that's been coined. It's called benevolent sexism, which I was like, that sounds like an oxymoron. So benevolent sexism is basically this thing that, so because men are afraid of hurting our feelings if they have to have a difficult conversation, that they don't tell us what they actually think or what they actually want to say because they think it's, it's going to be too hard for us, they're going to hurt us or something like that. And so they hold back the truth. And so this has an impact on us from a work standpoint. When women do receive feedback, it's, typi it's typically um, less specific than feedback given to them. There we go. And then studies have shown that women receive vague feedback that we are likely to be received to receive lower performance ratings. Because think about it. If you're not getting clear feedback, like if someone just said to Kathy, like, um, you can be better listener, but they didn't get anything specific. I mean, that's kind of hard to go on. But if you get really specific feedback, like we want you to be more of a servant leader and to involve us in the process and to ask us what we think, I mean, that's a different experience and a different conversation, right? So feedback, this is really important to how we think about this. So I'm gonna give you five questions that you can use going forward to help you be more effective at asking for feedback <coughs> and getting clear input. The first is after any project or meeting, ask these two questions. What's one thing I did well? One thing I did well. When we find out from somebody else what we did well, that builds our confidence. The second question, these are very, these are super easy. Yeah, but you're, I guarantee you're not asking them now. So what's one thing I can do differently? It's one thing I could do. You notice the word's not better with the judgment? Differently. One thing I could have done differently in that meeting. In, on that project, in that conversation, on that phone call. If you're asking these questions every single day, imagine how much better you'll be at what you do three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. Finding out what we could do differently builds our competence. Because we, we, we can all improve. I do this after every session. Debbie will get an email from me tomorrow. Well, I'll ask her, what's one thing I did particularly well, and what's one thing I could have done differently? Because I want to know. Like, what's the only way we get better is if we ask these questions. So these are two very basic questions you can begin asking tomorrow in conversation. And then if you're not getting the feedback you want that's really vague still, you can dig deeper. Follow-up questions. Can you give me an example of when I did that? So let's say someone's like, uh, you don't listen in meetings, or you interrupt people in meetings. Okay, let's say that someone says that to somebody. And they're like, give me an example. They're like, yeah, yesterday, Lisa was talking, and Susie, you started talking in longer sentence, and then she stopped talking. Okay, that's a very specific example. What was the impact you saw of that behavior? Well, everybody shut down and they got fidgety and it was really awkward. Hmm, okay. Um, how often do you see me doing this? Uh, do you really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Oh. She might want to change now that she knows that, right? But until we have this kind of feedback, we can't necessarily change. We need to be willing. This is brave to ask these questions. Most people will not ask these questions. So if we're going to be brave, we'll ask questions like this. Okay? So pick one. One, put yourself in a way when you're meeting, when you're having a conversation with someone. Bare minimum. Required to know money, very little work. Demonstrate curiosity. Use those dig deeper questions. Like, tell me more about that. Like, did I get that? This, by the way, works typically. It typically works with difficult people. Some people are too far gone and it's a challenge. But even with difficult people, they typically really don't feel hurt. And so if, if we can give them the opportunity to ask them to ask those questions, they can feel hurt. And then ask for that post-project feedback. Like, what could I do well? What could I do differently? So like, pick one of those and just start doing it. Like, it's a process. You'll flex and you'll figure out what works for you and what doesn't. All right. So we looked at how we show up intentionally. How do we be more self-aware? And the second thing we looked at was how we can use curiosity. Right? So the leaders of the future who are most effective are leaders who do those things. And they are leaders who intentionally take the time to connect. Like this is a lost art. Like we crave connection. 
people being loud on social media that's like, connect with me, see me, value me, like that's what that is. That's all that is. People acting out, someone being obnoxious, all that is is someone being like, see me. That's, that's really, it's like we're just big kids. <laughs> That's what we do. And so <coughs> connection is really crucial. So one of the things I've had the opportunity to do, because of all the stories I've, I've, I've heard from different leaders, I've, it's kind of shaped my perspective. And so in one case, I was interviewing the CEO of a client of ours. And this is a publicly traded company. And the HR team handed him off to me, and they were like, good luck with him. And I said, oh boy. <laughs> so they said, we're not sure you're going to get much out of him, but like, go for it. So I was like, I love a challenge. This call's not being recorded, so <laughs> I can say what I want. So I asked him a bunch of questions, and I come to find out that he was he was born and raised in the Midwest, and his father was actually an orphan. So he was raised by dad, he was an orphan. And he worked up to middle management position in a manufacturing company, and he instilled a really strong work ethic in his son, who I was now talking to. And so we were having this conversation, and, and I found out that he uprooted his entire family from the Midwest come over to the East Coast for this job, this executive position. And he like, left everything he knew. He was coaching the PB football team, and they went to the championships, it was like, amazing. And then he left all of that to come here. So I asked him a question, which by the way, if you want to kind of drill into something in your life that's not working, this is a really great question to ask yourself. If it were just right, what would it look like? So if my career were just right, if my relationship with my partner were just right, if my relationship with my boss were just right, if my sleep were just right, like, Fill in the blank. If it were just right, what would it look like? Most of us do not take the time to think about that. And so I asked him that question, and I said, if it were just right, what would it look like? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, in a perfect world, it would be nice to have personal friendships in your own. He was 65 years old, and he was lonely. So I want you to think about the leaders of your organization that maybe you're like, this person is like such a curmudgeon, he's like the guy from Up, you know, he's like miserable and angry and mad at the world. Like, maybe he's lonely. Like, men struggle with this more than women do. Women do too. Like, this is an issue that a lot of people are, are facing, and interestingly, it actually affects their health. So there's been a study then that looked at different things that affect like early death, early mortality, and they found out living with air pollution is a 5% you know, increased risk of dying early. Obesity increases your risk of dying by 20%. Excessive drinking increases the risk by 30%. And I was in um, I was in Las Vegas doing a presentation, and these came up, and I had a moment of like, that's Las Vegas. <laughs> 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 and then this is Las Vegas too. Um, loneliness has a greater impact on early death than excessive drinking, obesity, or air pollution. A lot of people feel lonely. Surrounded by people, but lonely. I struggled with this. This is one of the things that came out of my experience of burning out, that I realized I was lonely. I was so socially disconnected because I was so focused on getting ahead and proving how great I was and how impressive I was and how successful I was, that I had not invested in my relationships. And one of the things I believe that was causing me to be sick was the fact that I was so relationally disconnected from people that knew me that could speak truth to me, that could encourage me and support me. Like, I hadn't left that in the dust. Men tend to feel lonely more than women do at work, and this affects every generation. Every generation struggles with some degree of loneliness, and it's more prevalent among the younger generations, which we think, oh, they're so digitally connected, yet intimately disconnected. There's a difference. There's a difference. We have the illusion of connection because of technology oftentimes. It's wonderful. I mean, if you have family in another country or out of state, it's a great way to connect, certainly. But there is nothing that replaces face-to-face, in-person communication beings. There's nothing that replaces that, nothing. So you have to make more time for that. 60% of employees would be more inclined to stay with their company if they have more friends. And so this affects retention. This isn't just like, it's a personal thing for sure, but it's also a retention thing. And we know that next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival. To be understood, to be affirmed, to be valued, and to be appreciated. Everybody wants this. Regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of anything. This is what human beings need. Like, we need connection. 
You need this to thrive. I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to do something. Some of you have been to some other sessions I've done. I love the activity so much, and you can do it every day and be different. So it's called the inside scoop. So what you're going to do in a moment is actually I'm going to ask you to take your phones out, which is like, you just tell us how bad our phones are. But um, <laughs> you're going to take your phone out. You're going to find one person to buddy up with. And, and when I say go is when you will go. And what you're going to do is you're going to think about something that's on your phone that is important to you. So you're going to share for about a minute. I think it's going to be time. It's going to be a minute per person. So there's going to be a bell that's going to ding. My husband's an elementary school teacher. goes to school bell. <laughs> Um, there's going to be a countdown clock, don't look at it, just listen to the sound. And you're going to share with your neighbor like, something about your life that's important to you. So, through pictures, whether it could be a person, a place you went to, whatever. But I'm going to give you a minute to be like, all right, let me, let me check my pictures real quick here. Um, <laughs> and then I'll give you like 10 seconds, and then you can begin, and so one of you will share, and then after a minute, you will switch, and the other person will share. And if you didn't bring your phone for some reason, then you can just paint a picture for the other person something or someone that's important to you. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm going to have you start. If I see someone that's lacking a partner, I will match you up. But try to find someone. Like, you, like this can't be a trio activity. It's got to be adults. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then it's yourself. All right. Okay. <laughs> Do that at the dinner table, and you're like, "Fuck, teenagers, forget it." 
But like, try to <laughs> like, use your phone for good, right? Like, use your phone to do something positive. The reason why all this matters is because connection, kindness, and time together build trust. And so when we take the time to get to know people and to listen to people and to be present for them, to give them more than a minute, I was doing that for the purposes of demonstration, but imagine you've got five minutes to have the floor to just share about yourself. Like that really helps you get those seen. The reason why this matters is because it's hard to trust someone you don't know. And so this is a way for us to get to know people in a safe way. It's like, everyone's got their phone out anyway, so it's like, show me a picture. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to, right, we have to come together as women to like connect with each other. That's why communities like this are so important. Like, <laughs> I love this audience <laughs> We have to come together and like connect with each other. And there's actually proof that this is going to get you further in business. Women who have a close inner circle, inner circle of close female contacts are more likely to land executive positions with greater authority and higher pay. So hopefully you're doing this for altruistic reasons. <laughs> but if you're not, <laughs> close inner circle, right? Because when we connect with each other, when we connect with other women, and we are supported and encouraged by other women, and we build up this kind of community with other women, which is what you have the opportunity to do with people in this room. Like, we all rise together, right? We know that really like successful women are surrounded by a tribe of other successful women who have their back. <laughs> None of this competitive stuff. There's like not enough of us for us like, to do that. We have to align with each other and rally around each other and support each other. And these, these are some of my supporters. They're all over the country. They're Nashville and Chicago and Omaha, Nebraska. And one of the things that I've experienced as I've gone through this transformation after the past two years is that I meet these people. Like, I'm not going to get to the next level of what I'm meant to do if I am not surrounded, supported by, connected to, sharing with, open with other women. Like, we need men too, but we also, there's something different about being in a community, right? Of like us connecting. So, I'm going to take a picture of this in the interest of time. I'm going to give this to you as your homework. Yeah. Who's in your circle of connections? Like for a concert, like, like a concert. <coughs> who's been a mentor to you? Who picks you up when you need a boost? Who brings you joy and happiness? Who are a few people who have taken an active interest in your success and have a habit of telling the truth when it's hard? Your truth tellers are gold. The people that will tell you just what, not just what you want to hear, but what you need to hear in a kind way, those people are gold. And who is a junior colleague that you can support, even if you're like, I'm kind of just starting out too? Who else, who could you look after? Who could you teach the things you wish you knew when you started out? Like, be a woman who lifts other women up with you. And reach out to one of these people. One of these names you write down, reach out to one of these people and express your appreciation for the role that they've played in your life. So introduce your team to the inside scoop and reach out to someone in your circle of connection. Express appreciation. Like, we have to start doing this. You, they may have no idea the impact they've had on your life. They may have no idea. We assume they know, they don't always know. I know some of you had jotted down when you first came and you had a card on top of your folder. And I know some of you were jotting down your piece of advice. I'm gonna grab it right here. So it looks like this. It says, uh, Rachel, use your input. And I know we're at times really the last thing. Um, you could give one piece of advice to your younger self. What would it be? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna convert, compile all of these and send these back out to you. So feel free to distribute this among like the women's groups at your organization. And then on the back side, if you want to connect with me beyond this, feel free to put your contact information. I'll be happy to follow up with you and have it, you know, chat more about the stuff we've talked about today. So um, I'll close with this. And so we have a card, which you have might have fallen off your board, but it looks like a little card. We cannot change what we are not aware of. And once we are aware, we can't help but change. So I encourage you to be women who show up intentionally, who have the humility and the courage to be self-aware, to receive feedback even when it's hard, and then to act on it. To be women who ask questions, who listen empathetically, who are present for people, who see people, who accept people, who make people feel like they matter. And be women who intentionally connect with people around you and with other women and be a woman who lifts other women up. If we begin to do this, like we will completely change the future of leadership in this industry if you are willing to be women who 
could do these difficult things. So with that, thank you all so much. Thank you again so much and have a great rest of your day.